I'm Stephanie Hickey, one of the um, organize, co-organizers of Our Ladies Youth Lansing, and I'm really excited to um, introduce Dr. Stephanie Hicks today. Um, Dr. Hicks is an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and um, she's also a co-founder of Our Ladies Baltimore, and um, uh, today her talk is about design principles of data analysis. And what I'm really excited about is in addition to her, her um, fantastic research, which is mostly developing uh, methods for analyzing um, single cell um, RNA sequencing data and other modalities of um, single cell data. She's also extremely passionate about um, data science education and um, especially about teaching real world data science skills and uh, expanding and diversifying the data science community and in recognition of her research teaching and outreach dr hicks was recently selected for the american statistical association's teaching in the health sciences young investigator award um, and so we're really excited to have her here to you know, share some of her passion for data science education with us. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Hicks. And take it away when you're ready. Awesome. Okay, let me try to share some stuff first. Uh, what do you see? It looks good. You see something changing? Okay, cool. Yep. Um, awesome. So thank you so much for the really kind introduction and um, when Stephanie recommended the, the topic of this, it's something that's near and dear to my heart, though it's probably going to be a little different than um, maybe your typical analysis or um, uh, talk that you give. So this is very much ongoing and active work with my colleague Roger Pang at Hopkins and Lucy D'Agostino McGowan from Wake Forest, um, Jeff, Jeff Leak from Hopkins. The, the idea here is that we want to help um, people who are new to data analysis kind of understand the space for how to build data analyses. So I'm going to get to this in a minute, but whenever you um, are new to the world of art or new to the world of music, for example, if you wanted to understand and kind of like understand the kind of variation and the types of art that are out there or the type of music that's out there you you know there are um, books lots of libraries filled with books and um papers and uh, uh books like encyclopedias that have like compared and contrast like different types of art or different types of music for example and so when you're coming to data analysis for the first time i find one of the barriers that um, an analyst hits is kind of understanding the landscape of the different types of analyses that one could create and in that quest to try and help people understand how one creates a data analysis from a design perspective. Um, that's what this sort of like talk is about, trying to think about what are the design principles behind building a data analysis so that somebody new to the world of data analysis can sort of understand the types of variation that can exist in analyses and also potentially be able to help somebody build an analysis with a particular consumer in mind. So like, for example, me as an analyst, I may build an analysis a certain way, but the consumer who's going to consume the analysis, maybe my boss or my manager, they may expect, you know, a, a certain um, flavor of an analysis or a certain, a certain type of plot or um, maybe a super skeptical analysis. And so thinking about this knob of being able to like one, describe these principles of how to build analyses, like how the analyses can vary across different axes of variation, but then also how can we like tune the knobs such that we can maybe be more aligned with um, people who are consuming the analyses. That's like the high level overview. It's going to get um, kind of fun and probably different, but I just wanted to like keep that in mind as we're going through today. Okay, so um, first, what is a data analysis? What do I mean by that? So here is a picture of the, the Golden Gate Bridge. And like the, the Golden Gate Bridge, um, this 
bridge does not occur naturally. Um, our data analyses do not occur naturally. They don't just like magically exist in space. Um, they need to be designed to be, I'm arguing they need to be designed to be useful. Um, and solutions for building data analyses and solutions for building bridge, bridges can come in many different forms. Um, however, there must be some like basic structural principles <laughs> that have to be followed. Otherwise, like the bridge will collapse or otherwise your analysis like doesn't make sense. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is like the bridge collapsing, for example. Um, so here's an illustration of a data analysis workflow as depicted by Hadley Wickham's um, very popular diagram in his R for data science, where on the left, you start with some kind of import um, function where you take data and you import it into a programming language like R, you tidy it up, meaning that you transform it or wrangle it in a way that allows you to prepare to visualize and or model it. And you go in this cycle of um, transforming visualization modeling until you're ready to communicate those results. So I have um, basically reformatted a version, like I've created a version of Hadley's workflow, data analysis workflow, where I've got data now at the top and I'm converting it into tidy data. It's going through what, what I'm going to call the analysis kind of like cycle. Um, maybe it's like transform, visualize, model, and then we've got like some kind of results that uh, we want to talk about. Um, I think there are a couple of things missing from Hadley's workflow that I would like to just maybe suggest. One is um, who is the audience that the results are getting presented to? And this I find to be incredibly important when we're building a data analysis. This is not something that I feel like uh, at least in the field of statistics, it's often formally taught. Like we're often just building an analysis without necessarily a consumer or a stakeholder in mind or whoever the audience is. But this is actually a really important <laughs> um, part of who is going to be consuming that analysis. And then some other things that I feel like are missing from the workflow include things like what was the original question that was being asked? Um, what is the context of the problem that's being solved? What are the resources that are available to build the analysis? Do you have like an unlimited budget and you can spend 50 days or like 50 years on this project? Or do you have an unlimited number of GPUs? Or do you just have, you know, uh, a version of R installed on like a really old operating system? And like, so what are the resources to build the analysis? And then also the analysts themselves. So the analysts may also have like preferences for how one builds an analysis. So these are all really important um, concepts that I feel like are not sort of like that that might be like implicitly included in Hadley's workflow, but that are actually really important whenever you go to build an analysis when you're trying to communicate that to somebody for the first time. So um, if we only like we take away all the things that I just talked about and we only look at this part of it, for example, um, my point is that this starts to Think, this starts to um, look like maybe that that we're thinking about this as like maybe the data are just a bunch of numbers here. And this was said by Chris Anderson in 2008 in Wired Magazine. And he made the claim that, you know, with enough data, the numbers basically speak for themselves. Like we don't need to know who the audience is. We don't know who the analyst is. We don't need to know who the, what the context is, um, anything like that. And, and so Anderson's example is like the Google search algorithm. So for example, um, Google systems don't need to understand necessarily why some pages are more linked to others, only that it's happening. And then they are going to use that as an indicator of relevance when you're searching, um, that it's not important to know why, but like it's happening and I'm going to use that information um, and, and sort of like, the data are just a bunch of numbers and I'm just going to then continue to like rank these pages higher and higher. So Catherine uh, D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein from the Data Feminism, they asked, um, do numbers ever speak for themselves? And the short answer is no, and the long answer is no. They argue that actually context does matter and numbers do not speak for themselves. Um, and until, uh, oh, sorry, one second. 
And until uh, we really invest as much in providing and maintaining context as we do publishing data, we're just going to end up with like public information resources that are subpar at best and maybe even dangerous at worst, meaning um, if you don't provide the context um, in data analyses, like this can often lead to power imbalances or misaligned incentives, um, especially when the numbers have to do with human beings. And so like this could lead to discriminatory practices and be like, just not healthy and dangerous. So context does matter. So my point is um, these aspects, uh, question, context, resources uh, are really important in the context of building a data analysis. Okay, so let's um, think about why this might matter and talk about data analysis expectations. So let's say we have, um, uh, an idea in our head of what our data analysis looks like. So this is the expectation of what we think <laughs> um, we, we might get from an analysis, for example. And then we also have kind of like what we observe um, to have happen. And this is probably this is like an example of what actually happens in our analysis. And then there's, of course, like the deviation from reality of um, the difference between like what we expected to happen and then like what we observe. And then the question is, where did this go wrong or like what how, why is there like a deviation here? So I'm going to argue a couple of things that um, the expectation aspect of that is built on a couple of things. For example, what was the original question? What was the context of the problem being solved in? What were the resources? What's the prior work in this area? There are things that go into like understanding our expectation in a particular analysis. And then I'm going to argue nature is often one of the things why observed data might be different and that go into like making the observed data different. And then the deviation from reality are the results there. And so um, you could ask, well, how, I mean, like in some cases, those deviations might not be very big. And in other, in other cases, like uh, the deviation from what we expect from reality can be quite big. And so thinking about how we can teach um, individuals who are learning data analysis for the first time to manage those deviations and to have expectations and obs like observed like outcomes be more similar is like a goal of mine. And I think one way of doing that is to emphasize again, all those things that go into the expectation section and then putting um, like truth to what the observed data are and how like sometimes those are different. So um, in the practice of data analysis, I'm gonna argue that there are two main things that go on. Um, one that's often most widely talked about is something called statistical thinking. It's like uh, many people have many different sort of versions of this, but uh, it's this vague but intuitive process where the goal is to try and accurately describe or understand uncertainties in data. Um, and people leverage mathematics, statistics, computer science, psychology, I mean, all sorts of things to try and understand what's the most correct answer to my um, to what I'm asking. And, and I'm going through this process of statistical thinking to try and solve this problem. And I like to think about this as like, um, a narrowing where you have all of these tools and you have to try and figure out what's the right tool to be able to solve the problem to be most accurate or to understand the uncertainties in the best way, for example. And there are many ways that you can do this, right? So um, every analyst, of course, makes choices whenever you're starting to analyze data. So for example, you decide what methods or algorithms or models to use, what languages or workflows to use that can most accurately capture or describe a really complex world. Um, you could, for example, say, I'm gonna calculate a sample mean for a given set of observations. Or somebody else may say, no, 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 I'm gonna use the sample median because I have outliers. So we use the sample median in that case. Um, uh, you can also think about this in the context of like 
food, I like food, <laughs> where uh, let's assume we wanna make a burger and we have like these ingredients and we have to decide, okay, what are the ingredients that we wanna use to make a burger? And then we also have to decide what are the tools that we're gonna use to make this burger? What is the dressing that we want? Like these are all decisions that we make whenever we're building a data analysis. And then um, maybe we want to not put our burger in the crock pot and we want to like make the burger on a, a stove um, and so we're trying to figure out what's the right tool to be able to make a burger. That's kind of the concept of statistical thinking. It's this vague process where we're trying to figure out what's the best tool or um, ways to be able to build a burger. So in contrast to statistical thinking, um, I'm arguing that there's a complementary form of thinking that happens. And I'm going to call that design thinking where um, this often appears in when we're teaching statistics or when we're teaching people about analysis. But in contrast to statistical thinking, which I like to think of it as like a convergent process where we're coming to the right solution, design thinking, if you, if you study it, it's actually um, a very iterative solutions-based process where you're trying to problem solve and understand very deeply and empathize with the person for whom the product is being designed for. So thinking about the audience or the stakeholder or the, the consumer of the analysis. And a common feature of design thinking is to employ divergent thinking where um, you want to essentially identify and explore as many solutions as you possibly can and while empathizing with the consumer uh, for who's going, who's being designed uh, the product for. And again, this is like in contrast to convergent thinking that I'm gonna argue is like statistical thinking. And so um, in practice, when we're analyzing data, one way divergent thinking often manifests is like for a given question or decision that needs to be made, um, a producer and analyst can explore the design space of like, for example, how the information from the data can be extracted or summarized and presented. There are many different ways of doing that. Uh, so this was a study published in 2018 that demonstrated and, and had 61 different analysts all use the exact same data and investigate the exact same question. And they found that there's actually quite a bit of variation in how people analyze data. So the idea is these are the same ingredients and different meals were made <laughs> um, for these different 61 um, analysts. So like translating this to food, um, you know, a chef may make a meal that's a little bit more savory, a little bit more sweet, all with the same ingredients. Uh, you may make one that's hot or cold, uh, crunchy or chewy. And so there's no like right or wrong. It's just that like these meals all differ in sort of like many different axes of savory or sweet or chewy or not chewy. And, um, and so when we make these meals though, I'm often thinking about who's going to consume them. Uh, so for example, I'm often making meals for my children and like, I know that they have preferences. Like one of them goes around and only says, I like sweet things. And so I make meals to address <laughs> their preferences. Um, and so I'm maybe making similar, I'm using similar ingredients, but I'm making different meals depending on what their preferences are. Again, thinking about design thinking and who the product is going to be consumed by, similar to a data analysis using the same sort of ingredients. So um, I just wanna pause and like get back to what I originally said at the beginning about variation across data analyses. Again, if you are new to the world of art or music um, and, and you wanna know the types of art that's out there and like be able to contrast it, like there are books where you can go learn about the different types of art. People have characterized like the axes of variation where art can fall. Um, and so if you wanna do that for data analyses, that doesn't really exist. I'm arguing that doesn't really exist. Like somebody who comes to the world of data analysis, uh, they're not like databases of data analyses. There's the web and you can sort of like find example sort of like hodgepodgey, but there's not really a place for someone to learn about examples of data analyses that then they can like start to figure out, oh, I want to build this type of analysis or this type of analysis and so forth. And in particular, thinking about who's going to consume that analysis. Um, 
So let me give you an example. Um, let's assume I'm an analyst and I have a specific question I want to answer with a particular data set. Um, and the question is, is X associated with Y? Um, I get to make a decision as the analyst of what I'm going to use to investigate with this question. So um, I could make a plot, like a scatter plot um, of X against Y, and that could be the end of it. Like I could say, is X associated with Y I made a plot and that's the end. Or I could try to quantify that relationship uh, like with a linear model and or quantify the linear association between X and Y and calculate like a Pearson correlation coefficient. And so I'm gonna argue that there's some kind of question that's being asked. And then I'm gonna argue that there's a data analytic element such as a scatter plot or a Pearson correlation coefficient that's being used to investigate this question. So um, one, on one extreme, an analyst may say, okay, I've got a question. I did, a, I made a plot, um, there's the result. My plot is the, I mean, my, my result is that the, there's, um, there's not like a yes or no, it's just like a, a visualization of the relationship between X and Y. Alternatively, a data analyst may investigate and use multiple elements to investigate this question. They may like um, make a plot, calculate the Pearson correlation, calculate the Spearman correlation. They may fit a linear model. They like may do all these things, right? Um, I'm gonna like suggest that these two types of um, extremes are either more exhaustive or less exhaustive. And I see analyses that fall sort of like on extremes or in the middle. But I don't think, for example, when you're new to analysis that these extremes are very obvious to students that like, should you just make one, should you investigate with just one element and call it a day? Or should you investigate with multiple elements and call it a day? It kind of depends on what the preferences are for the analyst. And it kind of depends on what the preferences are for the person consuming that, that analysis. They may want just a plot. They don't, they might not want any like quantitative assessment, or maybe they have to have a quantitative assessment. And so this is an access of variation that I often see analyses sort of like existing in, um, if that makes sense. And so, and um, with this goal of um, these axes of variation, we started to think about different axes that like data analyses can fall on um, with the goal of a consumer or a stakeholder or an audience in mind. And so let's say, for example, you can think about this principle, a data analysis principle as the, like the knob that I had at the beginning, where um, an analyst turns down the exhaustive knob. They're not super exhaustive. They just make a scatter plot. And the audience, the boss, so the person consuming it, they're also pretty like, they don't care so much about exhaustive analyses. They just want like an element to be investigated and they just need like a quick answer. And in this case, I'm gonna argue that like there is an alignment uh, on this principle for this data analysis between the analyst and the audience. And again, you can think about it, like the idea is to think about it with these knobs uh, where it can be turned up or turned down and so forth, or there can be more or less. I should have like clicked on this, sorry. Um, okay, so then in contrast, let's say the audience or the consumer is like wanting a very exhaustive analysis. So they've like turned their exhaustive analysis knob way up. And in this case, there is a misalignment um, between the analyst and the, the consumer or the audience. And I find that when somebody is first getting into the world of analysis, this is not so obvious to people that like they might build an analysis and then they are disgruntled or confused as to why the person who's consuming the analysis is, um, you know, not like was expecting something different. Their deviation from reality was quite big there. And it was just because the analyst built an analysis with on a certain access of design principles different than what was the preferences for an audience and so forth. So um, these design principles, they are designed to really reflect qualities of a data analysis. They're not designed to be good or bad. 
whether you have an exhaustive or analysis or a non-exhaustive analysis, like a high or a low exhaustive analysis, that in and of itself does not mean an analysis is good or bad. I'm framing this as like whether or not there is an alignment between you as the analyst and the consumer of the analysis, whoever they may be. Um, and so these characteristics and these preferences, of course, can be like highly influenced by outside constraints like resources, time or budget. I mean, it may be that, you know, your boss is like, give me an answer now. And so you only have 10 minutes to do a quick analysis in R and in that way, um, you know, you're ramped down on exhaustive <laughs> analyses, like you're just going to make like a scatter plot or calculate a Pearson correlation and move on. Um, and so the thing I, I want people to know is that like the data analysis, um, the data analyst, when they assign weights to these design principles, and that can lead to different analyses, like it can lead to an analysis that's more exhaustive or less exhaustive, and there's nothing necessarily wrong, but there are these weights that are assigned to, um, like internally when we build these analyses. And so um, I thought a little bit about what is an aligned data analysis in the context of um, the audience or the consumer or the stakeholder? And going back to what I originally talked about is that data analyses, of course, must be designed to be useful. And when we think about design thinking in this space, the goal is one, um, to identify the problem and um, build a solution. So when we think about identifying the problem, we're often doing exploratory data analysis and we think about building the solution, we're often thinking about modeling or measuring uncertainty and so forth. Um, and the audience themselves, they have their own wants and expectations or these weights that we're talking about. And so um, every, again, when we talk about analyses, I think about it as who is the analyst and who is the audience. Um, the analyst conducts and leads the data analysis, the audience or this consumer, they're reviewing or receiving the analysis or consuming it. And I'm arguing that the analysts and the audience, they each have their own weights along these um, design principle axes. And an aligned analysis is one in which the audience accepts essentially what the analyst is doing and agrees upon the weighting. So they agree that the weighting is correct like and that they are happy with the analysis. So you could think about it uh, where the weights of principle one through principle N for the analysts and the audience match versus the weights of principle one through principle n don't match versus like when they match versus when they don't match and so forth. Um, so I am probably going over time, but I've, I've thought about different ways of like quantifying this, like in the context of um, if we do have weights that exist for different analyses, how could we, for example, minimize the difference between them. So like an example would be, let's say you um, are a student working with a faculty member and you're interested in, you know, producing an analysis that they want, right? And so um, you would want to understand kind of like what their expectations are for these weights. And then you would want to build an analysis that sort of matches that. But there are different ways that you could imagine like trying to minimize the distance between the weights of the analysts and the audience? Like, do you minimize just one principle and say, like, I don't care about the rest? Or do you have to minimize, like, the distance between all the weights, like, kind of pairwise? Or do you want to just minimize the expected value of the difference? Like, on average, I want the difference between principle one and principle one between the analyst and the audience to be, like, on average, less than some value. And so I've thought a little bit about, like, how one does that. So, in this way, if we have some kind of weights for an analyst and weights for an audience, you can just like describe the principal specific weight difference with DIJ um, for analyst I and audience J and data analytic principal K. Um, and so you can put these all together in some kind of distance metric for all of the K principles, and then think about the following. So there could be something called strong pairwise alignment where um, 
you assume that the DIJs can never be zero. And the strong pairwise alignment basically says the max difference has to be less than epsilon across all the Ks. So that's like pretty strict. Like you're making sure that the weights um, have to be matched. Um, alternatively, you could do something a little bit more relaxed, like a weak pairwise alignment, where um, you put some kind of norm on the distances. And then you say, I want that to be less than some epsilon. Um, and here, this allows you know a little bit of difference between the audience and the analyst on like how they may weight each principle. Um, but overall, the differences have to be small, just overall. Um, and then you could also do this thing where the expected value of the distances have to be equal to zero. Um, so there's some like distinctions that whenever you throw in now and make this a random variable of like how one thinks about this. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this if people are interested. Uh, but in this setting, this can really, like in the former setting, it can really only be evaluated when the audience and the analyst meet and um, a data analysis is presented. This one allows you to sort of like know some kind of field specific effect. Like I know statisticians in general like this, and I know computational biologists like this. And now I want to like on average, make sure that these principles match, for example, or minimized or aligned. Um, Okay, so then the, the last like two slides. Am I just giving people what they want? I mean, kind of, but I'm also like helping people know or analysts for the first time that the audience really matters and that it's worth thinking about who the audience is whenever you are um, building analyses. It's not necessarily the case that you may always wanna optimize this alignment criterion, but I think it's worth noting why you might get bad feedback on this analysis analysis is not good if um, there is a misalignment. And it might be the case that you don't care and you want to build an analysis the way you want to build it. But like if your goal is to align yourself with somebody to be able to produce analysis that they accept, I think it's kind of cool to think about these design principles as a way to help analysts understand how to improve their analyses kind of going forward. Um, so in summary, data analyses should be designed based on a set of shared principles. Um, identifying relevant principles really requires consideration of the audience. Even a good analysis can be misaligned. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, there are different, uh, I would argue metrics than alignment that other people might be interested in. Like, is an analysis valid? Is an analysis honest? Is an analysis complete? These are totally different things. Um, and then I really am interested in using this as a form of intervention. Like if we are able to provide in like quantitative values to these distances and we are, um, we see that there is a misalignment, for example, can we then intervene and tell the analyst how, what to specifically improve to be able to uh, make a more aligned analyst or an alignment, aligned analysis. There are a couple of preprints that are on archive. One of them is almost ready to be accepted for publication. So stay tuned, uh, but it's been a lot of fun working in this area and I'm happy to take feedback. Thanks everyone. <laughs> if no one else has any questions, um, I'll, I'll ask one. So I can imagine um, these sort of thinking about these principles of data analysis being important, for example, if you're moving from maybe transitioning from, you know, mostly presenting to one audience to suddenly another one. For example, if you're working in an academic setting and then all of a sudden you get a job, all of a sudden you get a job as, um, you know, a data scientist in some sort of in, in industry. And I wonder, uh, do you think if these sort of design principles become a more common phenomena, I could imagine like some sort of like poster up in, in you know, an office. It's like, these are how we want our design principles to be some sort of like SOP for, um, you know, building analyses for in, in certain things. But do you uh, like, imagine there ever being sort of just like a set, like these are the design principles for data analysis, or do you think it'll be like extremely field flexible as to what sort of principles are important at all? 
Yeah, so we in our one of the preprints that I, I listed there, the design one, we actually like put out, you know, here's a set of seven that we think exist. And um, we have like plots sort of like describing and, and like text describing what we mean by it. And we have different ways of like um, that we would quantify them. So like one of them is reproducibility. So this is kind of like very touchy, but I'm arguing that reproducibility is not necessarily good and bad, uh, meaning that it's like you could make an analysis that's more reproducible and less reproducible. If I open up R and I run a Pearson correlation of a data set, but I don't save that script, for example, that is an irreproducible analysis, meaning that like it's gone the moment I close R. Does that make it bad? I, I'm arguing no, because it might be that there was a huge constraint on like, I needed to produce this code now and I didn't spend the time to save it and put it in a GitHub repository and like, like I, I just like ran it. And so I think there are reasons why one might make a less reproducible analysis versus a more reproducible analysis. Now it is true in general, a lot of people prioritize that, but some people um, it's not such a big priority. And so um, I am postulating that like reproducibility is one of them, that analyses can exist in this dimension that are more reproducible and less reproducible. And just by the existence of being more reproducible and less reproducible, it, it does not mean it is like necessarily good and bad until one talks about like evaluating it. And that brings in an audience, an analyst, and like the all the other things that I talked about outside of like the little workflow that Hadley started out with. And so I am um, interested in understanding what these principles are. We, we tried our best to like put out there what we think are a few of them. I'm sure it's not an incomplete, I'm sure it's not a complete list. I'm sure it's an incomplete list. And I would love to have like a larger discussion on what are these axes of variation that analyses live on. Because I personally would love to have a poster or um, a list to provide to students for the first time working on analyses so that they are aware that you know anal analyses can live in these sort of like dimensions and it's something to think about when you're building an analysis, um, if that makes sense. Totally, just to have even some common language would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Steffi. Hi, thank you. Um, I apologize, I missed the first 10 minutes. So if this is related to that, just to let me know. Um, I think one thing, maybe I kind of misunderstood a little bit the, the idea behind the design principles, but um, I think something I kept thinking of the whole time you were kind of talking about this is like, oh yes, I know exactly what this is. <laughs> I'm a consultant, right? And I work with my clients. And so I, I kept thinking to myself of this alignment though, um, like that's a shifting thing, right? Because like so one thing I do that, you know, like I try to do is I try to, like I do have my opinions about what should be done. And I try to have that conversation with my client about this is why I really think we should do this. If you really don't want me to, like I won't, but I really, really think we should. And, you know, and they, they also will tell me like, this has to be done for these reasons. And, um, and that brings us our alignment back together, I guess. Um, so I was just like, where does that kind of interpersonal stuff kind of fit into this idea? It's the same thing with students. Like I know like sometimes students need to be, um, you know, the supervisor is kind of informing the students of like, no, 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 you got to bring it over here. But sometimes it's vice versa. Sometimes the students are like, no, you, you need to catch up. <laughs> you need to bring it back over here. Um, I'm just kind of curious about the interpersonal and that teaching that kind of, um, if that kind of features anywhere. Yeah, you're like light years ahead of me. Like I find just giving this talk alone is hard enough <laughs> to explain to somebody the difference. No, 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 it's exactly where I want the conversation to go. So what I want to have is like one agreement and sort of like a, a discussion, a large discussion on what are the principles. And then I want to discuss like, what are the ways that we can align them and how like there are many different ways that we could align them and then also intervene. Like, I think that's what you're getting at with the interpersonal aspect. Like um, you have 
have that communication and that conversation with the person consuming it. And then you decide, okay, well, I'm going to like do this, or I'm going to do this. And then, because I know that they want this, or I want this. And so the idea would be to leverage this kind of framework and maybe have some kind of intermediate quantity where we say like at this time point, there was an evaluation and there was a misalignment and we had a communication and then we go forward. Um, I, that is the kind of framework that I hope, and I would love to see happen in the future. If people are interested in talking about this, <laughs> but I I'm interested in like formalizing it because like what you're saying is completely natural and I understand it, but it like to somebody who's never done that before, mm. it's very overwhelming to kind of yeah. know, I need to like a change. I need to like think about who am I consuming, yeah. who's going to be consuming it? Because I find often the first time somebody starts to analyze the data, they're like, they just follow some code because that's what they see online. And then they get feedback on it. And they're like, whoa, I don't understand why this doesn't work or this does work. And I think like that feedback often happens in like a PhD or a master's thesis, for example. Yeah. But I'd love to like formalize those concepts in the classroom or like like in an industry setting where it's very easy to understand. Like it's very clear what we're talking about as opposed to like, don't you know that you need to do this instead of this? Like that is frustrating to somebody who's never really like experienced that before if that makes sense that is no that's really it's an interesting way of thinking about it because it is something I, I've kind of learned and I guess I do but and so that's what I was, it was kind of interesting for me to be like hey there's actually a formal framework for this um but I think it might have been easier if I kind of had some training like you're suggesting in it beforehand instead of just kind of figuring it out <laughs> or that's my, know, goal. <laughs> <laughs> that's my goal that's my goal yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can I ask a quick question? Um, so kind of dovetailing on that and, and where this enters in the classroom and, and kind of before master's or, or PhD to get this, this sort of feedback, are, are you thinking this might be kind of a, a core course within an undergraduate framework or something in a graduate framework or kind of where in the I guess, course um, process, do you, you kind of see this coming in? Because I think sometimes some, in, in my own experience, I've, I've found sometimes that it's hard for me to even know the right words and things to ask to, for the statistical thinking aspect of it before I can begin to apply kind of the design. So I don't know what your, what your thoughts are on, on that whole. Yeah, I, I think there must be some level of technical skills that in it, you call it statistical thinking at some level of statistic or some kind of technical training where um, it whether it's in statistics or whether it's computer science or business or engineering, whatever it is, there, there has to be some kind of technical foundational training to be able to understand like what is an element that we're going to use to investigate within an, like um, a, a question, for example. Otherwise, like that aspect doesn't make a lot of sense to someone. And so I do feel like there has to be, I don't know if you call it some level of struggle, but some level of like understanding the technical aspects or foundational aspects to a field before you can like start to introduce these concepts. That being said, one would hope that it's not like at the end of their like training where, you know, you struggle for a long time and then you're like, oh, I really wish I, like somebody had like formalized these concepts for me. So I don't have like a strong sense of exactly where it would fit, but I do agree that there needs to be some level of technical foundation provided in the training first. Um, and it doesn't have to be like exhaustive by any means, but it, enough to like feel like a person could analyze data um, with some level of like <laughs> confidence. And so I could imagine you know, some, some really awesome undergrads doing it. And I could imagine like um, being more relevant at the graduate level too. But I really think it's, it's designed for individuals who um, want to like think about uh, building analyses and like eva ways to evaluate analyses. Like some people just may not care about this sort of like thinking. And I don't necessarily know if it like fits into a statistics like training or like what kind of department either. Um, but I, I do feel very strongly that like a lot of this in this, a lot of these concepts are taught in a very ad hoc way in a very painful way for students. And I, I want to like change that. And I would love to see different departments pick it up or like some version of it. Maybe it's even a lecture. Um, but 
I think it needs a lot more work, but I really just like wanted to talk about it so I could get other people's feedback on like, even what are the principles that they think are there and um, how would you like to see this kind of work introduced um, like via interventions or in the classroom? So yeah, that's my goal today. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Go for it, Arjun. Hey, thanks. Please tell me, uh, it was a super talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was, uh, when you were talking about these, you know, points and text, at some point in your talk, I was expecting you to turn this into a constraint optimization and you definitely did that. Okay, so it was great. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so uh, I think the question really, uh, it's, I really like this because it's always hard to articulate what one wants and i think your your work sort of gives some kind of a language to talk about this and i think that's that's really nice and i wanted to get your thoughts i mean your comment on the following right and in research we know this that the expectations that we have actually continuously changes with time and then even the principles that we want or rather we weigh our weights on these principles also we continuously get recalibrated and that yeah. doesn't change until we see the result at the current point yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're talking about like time models. I mean, like <laughs> time varying models, which like I think is a natural way to describe this as well. This is like thinking about it as a fixed time point. Like I'm even like thinking this is like a super simplistic, like one time point, one set of fields, uh, one analyst, one audience, like one member in an audience even. Um, and so I, I feel like there's a lot of room for um, contributions like methodological contributions to being able to explain and like describe like how we could think about this and time varying effects I think are one of them like what if we could quantify like these weights at across time um and then like how would one uh think about adapting this in the sense of wanting to like realign if there's a mismatch because some there's like a change point in somebody's career such as a field or a preference changes um yeah i think that's really important and not at all something that i have thought much about <laughs> all right well um unless anyone um has any more questions um we should go ahead and uh thank dr hicks and stick around for a second for um, an announcement right afterward thank you everyone thanks awesome have a great day. thank you so much stephanie it was a fantastic talk and uh, one quick announcement for those of you who are here um we would like to hold a mixer for our ladies east lansing again in a hybrid format with in-person and virtual so if any of you are interested in volunteering or take up any leadership or any other kind of partnership role with us, we are looking forward to talking to you and meeting you. So without further ado, thank you once again, both Stephanie's. It was a fantastic day overall. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Take care.